popular to uh you know, there are places you can go and just have hyperbarics as part of an anti aging right. clinic. Michael Jackson had one of these, didn't he? Well, I have four of the same chambers that Michael Jackson had. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we use it for things like brain injury, stroke. Um, we use it for children with cerebral palsy, obviously for wound healing, for which it's really an incredible therapy. If you're claustrophobic, you go nuts in there, don't you? Well, I'm a bit claustrophobic, um, but it's a totally clear acrylic chamber, so you can see out. And it doesn't. You don't feel enclosed. I see. Okay. You can watch a uh, television program and... It isn't uh, really much of an issue. And the other thing is, if you don't like it, you can come right out. Okay, so you're not trapped in there. No, no. You tell the, There's a technician sitting there with you the whole time. Okay. Hopefully. And, yeah, uh, just my luck, they'd leave when it hits me. Get me out of uh, here. But it's a very, very powerful and, and incredibly underutilized uh, modality. In Germany, for example, if you have a stroke, you're immediately treated with hyperbaric oxygen because it's a way of giving oxygen to cells that may not be getting blood supply. So they're still getting oxygenation even though they're not getting blood, which normally is their source of oxygen. And in England, uh, they've been treating multiple sclerosis with hyperbaric oxygen therapy since about 1981 when the first publications came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, the most perhaps well-respected medical journal on the planet. So... You know, sometimes I guess it's a case of people being down on what they're not up on. Do brain cells grow back? Well, not throughout the brain, unfortunately. They do not. No, but the unique thing about the brain is that it does have this process of what we call neurogenesis. I love the term, neurogenesis. And uniquely in the human brain, it does occur, and that was only discovered about 14 years ago, in the area of the brain where we need those cells the most, which is called the hippocampus. As I mentioned earlier, that's the area that processes uh, memories or experiences and makes them into memories and also is involved with retrieving those memories so that we can learn and, and act upon our previous experiences. So the hippocampus <clears throat> does, throughout our lifetimes, continue to grow new brain cells, which... You know, it's a good thing. When uh, I remember back in college years, remember people would tell you, "Well, every beer you drink is you'd lose twenty thousand brain cells." So, uh, how fortunate that we actually repopulate that area where we need those cells most. But the 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 purpose of you know one of the key concepts of our book, "Power Up Your Brain," is we explain in that book what you can do to enhance neurogenesis. How do you turn on that process of growing new brain cells? So. You know, it's all these these ideas we have talked about earlier this evening about epigenetics. How do we activate the, the the genes, the DNA, that codes for those proteins that stimulate the growth of new brain cells? And we do it with physical exercise. We do it with caloric restriction. The omega-3 DHA that we mentioned earlier is a powerful trigger for producing those chemicals to grow new brain cells and even beyond that, to allow brain cells to connect to each other through that process of neuroplasticity. Where are we as a nation with brain research compared to other countries? Well, we have some outstanding uh, leading-edge brain research. Uh, we do. Uh, England does. Um, and you know, there's wonderful research going on uh, around the globe. Um, in the Philippines, as a matter of fact, are, are really doing some incredible work. So, you know, it's really a, a global sort of uh, endeavor, but you know, we've got some incredible brain researchers here in this country. Um, I have the, you know, the wonderful opportunity to travel the world and lecture and meet with just uh, people doing just breathtaking, outstanding work. But you know, the real issue is that's all well and good. Why does it have to wait to trickle down to the common man to learn what he or she can do today, not so much to treat brain disorders, but to maintain a healthy brain? Because, you know, frankly, uh, we're doing a lot to keep ourselves looking good. You know, you see plenty of people that are 70s and 80s that still look pretty good. That's true. But they're already not firing on all cylinders. So, mm. we, you know, it, it's sort of my mission here to say, look, there's lots of good things we can do to preserve brain function. No, there's, there's nothing worse than, uh, you know, looking young and having an old brain. Well, and, you know, the, the, the important thing to understand is it's within our grasp. There was a, a wonderful review. Well, hold on, hold on for a second, David. Okay. We're already at the top of the hour. Then we'll come back and take more calls too. So we were talking about uh, what good is it being uh, youthful looking if your brain isn't? What do you do? Doctor David Perlmutter, our special guest tonight. 
So, David, to tell me, with the ability to look good these days, if you can't keep your brain young, what do you do? Well, you're in big trouble. And, you know, it's a situation of your body's writing checks that your mind can't fill. And, uh, I, you know, I, I think it's a top-down kind of approach that I take. And I think uh, we just spend so much time being concerned about our physical beauty. And, you know, I'm often asked to lecture at anti-aging conferences. And it's interesting when you go there that you see 99% of what's going on there is having to do with looking good and, you know, the, the the bottom line is that most of these people, at least physiologically, are not in good shape at all. So, you know, there's a lot you can do cosmetically, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really help you in terms of your, not just your lifespan, but your health span, which is to say aging gracefully and aging in such a way that you remain healthy and, and full of vitality and able to appreciate your life even as, you know, we enter our our 70s and 80s and 90s. And there are plenty of patients I see each day who are active in their 90s and 80s and doing things and just as many in their 60s who are finished because they didn't take care of themselves. So, you know, we don't generally assume that our human bodies and our brains come with an owner's manual. And I think uh, it's time that we supplied that information to people so that they can be empowered by that. Knowledge is power. And in this case, um, knowledge is, is gained by the, the, this power of understanding, you know, what are the choices we need to make to, to in, can keep our brains functioning well and stave off disease. What are some of the things you recommend uh, that they do first with the Power Up Your Brain program? Well, even beyond the Power Up Your Brain program, I, I think that the most important thing a person can do for his or her brain is physical exercise. And that might sound strange, but it turns out that in study after study, cognitive performance improves, risk for Alzheimer's declines, it, markers uh, of brain inflammation are reduced, markers of brain uh, antioxidant function are increased. So it's just very simple. It's a 20-minute uh, exercise done on a daily basis of an aerobic nature to increase the heart rate, and we typically target a heart rate of 180 minus a person's age as a ballpark, depending, of course, you know, variations based upon what kind of shape that person may be in. But of all the things we talk about in terms of nutritional supplements and meditation and certain foods to eat and those to avoid, turns out that statistically, uh, physical exercise is perhaps the most powerful epigenetic, in other words, modifies gene expression, most powerful epigenetic factor that there is, simple exercise. And it doesn't cost anything. You know, you go outside and walk, put on a pair of sneakers, and off you go. So it's not as if it's some very expensive, high-priced uh, stay at some institution where you're going to get some kind of unique stem cell therapy while you're getting intravenous vitamins and hyperbaric oxygen. Not so. <clears throat> Physical exercise, plain and simple. Okay, let's go to the phones if we can. First time caller, Long Beach, California. It's Sam's turn, first of all. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sam. George, uh, you just really hit it out of the park for me today with the perfect guest. You're Super. Waiting to... um, hi, doctor. Um, I, I have a Crohn's disease, and about four years ago, I had a, a pretty massive perforation, and I was knocked out for a month. And when I woke up, uh, my legs were like asleep. And uh, told them that, and I was immediately wheeled in, and they found a big blood clot. And so they got rid of that. It was from all that infection. I had like six liters in my belly. And uh, so anyway, as it turns out, they, they got that done. The legs never really came back all the way. And um, they finally had me see a neurologist, and uh, he just started uh, really just, it hit me with a vitamin barrage, you know, of, of everything. I guess I had moderate motor and severe nerve damage to my legs. And uh, um, I get Remicade every six weeks, and I've kind of insisted that they keep, uh, something in me told me to keep insisting that they give me the vitamins every time I get that. Um, right now he's got me on, uh, thousand, you know, one milligram of uh, folic acid and taking a couple of different bees. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a homocysteine. 
I'm taking turmeric thanks to George and his recommendation. I've been taking it for uh, for about a month now. Well, let me let me comment if I could. Uh, it is Sam, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, what it sounds like, at least from what you're describing, is that they've told you you have nerve injury or, or neuropathy uh, as a consequence of your severe flare-up of your inflammatory bowel disease, which is Crohn's disease. And, you know, again, I guess there should be a disclaimer here that I, because I'm not your doctor, but I would simply say that what you would want to discuss with your doctor would be a special type of vitamin B12, which we call methyl B12. That's M-E-T-H-Y-L B12. turns out that B12 is desperately important for regeneration of function and of, of nerves, of the peripheral nerves. And we will give uh, about 5,000 uh, micrograms of B12, which is 1 cc methyl B12, several times a week by injection. We actually teach our patients how to do that, along with a very unique uh, nutritional supplement called alpha lipoic acid, which you probably are taking. Yeah. Um, what, what he did with that, um, see, actually, it turns out I, I have a, a, a doctor that's um, Middle Eastern, but he hasn't been... Um, you know, really inputting kind of his own influences. He he had said basically the same kind of thing. He but he has me doing that uh that cobalt or whatever it is, the nasal spray once a week. Yeah, that that's, I'm, but uh, see, the, the problem that. is that is that cyanocobalamin, and that has indeed does have some cobalt in it, and that's why I'm not so excited about using it. The type okay. of B12 I use again, Sam, is methyl B12. Okay. There's no sense in checking your B12 level. Again, this was something you will discuss with your treating doctor since that's not me. Okay. But if you were to check your B12 level after receiving these injections, it would be so-called off the chart. And what I tell my patients is that's a good place to be on B12 because we're not in the maintenance uh, mentality here. We're in the repair mentality. So, again, you yeah. might discuss with your treating doctor significantly pushing that vitamin B12 and also adding in about 2,000 milligrams a day of alpha lipoic acid. Those are key players along with DHA and omega-3 fat uh, in terms of nerve repair. So see how they work with that. Okay, I will. Thank you so much uh, for that info. Uh, sure. Thanks for your call, Sam. Okay. Why do supplements help people so much? Well, uh, you know, the... We're supplementally uh, or nutritionally uh, almost uh, devoid in terms of the foods that are, are purveyed to uh, to Americans. Uh, what's in our food these days is just doesn't cover it in terms of the nutritional you know requirements right. of the human physiology. We often speak, not we, I say that parenthetically, of the minimum daily requirement of various vitamins. For example, the minimum daily requirement of vitamin C around 60 milligrams a day. What that means is that's the absolute minimum below which you would get a disease. And in the case of vitamin C, you'd get scurvy. It means just the minimal amount you could take and not get scurvy. What we ought to be considering is the optimal daily requirement or that amount of these nutrients that will provide a person with optimal health. And these numbers are typically many-fold larger than the minimum daily requirement. Next up, we go to Jeff in Ontario in Canada on the international line. Hey, Jeff, go ahead. Hello, yeah. Um, I'm a long-time listener. And, Thank you. Uh, this is awesome. Um, now, uh, I've stuttered for my entire life, and I'm not sure if it's genetic because my father also stutters, and my great-grandfather also did. Now, um, I had two questions. One is what causes it? And and number two um, is uh, what can I take in order to make my brain make the speech work properly? Oh, like um, I, I've uh, I've tried speech therapy all throughout grade school, high school, and honestly, it's a joke. Like um, it wasn't until. Uh, um, my late twenties that uh, that my speech started to straighten out, and uh, I could actually um, say uh, sentences um, without stuttering half as much as I. The first question: Clearly, there's a, gene a strong genetic component because we do see uh, that uh, while you know scientists have not specifically nailed down the exact so-called stuttering gene. 
you know, the pedigree analysis is clear that it's uh, far more, uh, that, that there is a strong uh, genetic component. Uh, 